Palm Sunday, the Gospel of the Sunday according to Matthew. At that time, when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage unto Mount Olivet, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go ye into the village that is over against you, and immediately you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them to me. And if any man shall say anything to you, say ye, that the Lord hath need of them, and forthwith he shall let them go. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh to thee, meek, and setting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of her that is used to the yoke. And the disciples going did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the ass and the colt, and laid their garments upon them, and made him sit thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, and others cut boughs from the trees, and strewed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Parallel Gospel according to Mark. And when they were drawing near to Jerusalem and to Bethania at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth two of his disciples, and saith to them, Go ye into the village that is over against you, and immediately at your coming in thither you shall find a colt tied upon which no man hath yet sat. Loose him, and bring him. And if any man shall say to you, What are you doing? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and immediately he will let him come hither. And going their way, they found the colt tied before the gate without, in the meeting of two ways, and they loose him. And some of them that stood there said to them, What do you loosing the colt? Who said to them as Jesus had commanded them, and they let him go with them. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they lay their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down boughs from the trees, and strewed them in the way. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh! Hosanna in the highest! The Gospel according to Luke. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethania, unto the mount called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into to the town which is over against you, at your entering into which you will find the colt of an ass tied, on which no man ever hath sitten. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man shall ask you, Why do you loose him? You shall say thus unto him, Because the Lord hath need of his service. And they that were sent went their way, and found the colt standing, as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said to them, Why loose you the colt? But they said, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and casting their garments on the colt, they set Jesus thereon. And according to John, and on the next day a great multitude that was come to the festival day, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young ass, and sat upon it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things his disciples did not know at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things to him. Exposition from the Catena Aurea And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, the evangelist had previously narrated that Jesus had departed from Galilee and had begun going up to Jerusalem. After this he stops to narrate what Jesus had done on the way, and then going on with his previous purpose says, And when they drew nigh, Bethpage was a little village belonging to the priests about a mile from Jerusalem, 
and situated on the Mount of Olives. For the priests, who were wont to serve on certain days in the temple, when they had completed their turn came out here to wait. Likewise those who had discharged their duty rested here, for it was a precept of the law that on the Sabbath no one should journey more than a mile. For this reason Bethpage is interpreted as the house of the jawbones, for in the law the jawbone was the particular portion of the priests. Saying to them, Go ye into the village. He did not say to his disciples, Say ye that his own Lord hath need of them, or your Lord, that they might understand that he alone is the Lord, and not alone of animals, but of all men. For sinners in their external state belong to him, but of their own free will they belong to the devil. Do not consider what here happened as being of little moment. For who persuaded the owners of the beasts, so that they agreed not to oppose him, to submit in silence and let them go? And in this also he instructed his disciples, for he could have checked the Jews, but he willed not to. He also teaches that whatsoever be asked of them they should give. For if they who knew not Christ so yielded, much more should his disciples give up all things. And forthwith he will, that he said, and forthwith he will let them go, must be understood to imply that the animal, as soon as he had entered into Jerusalem, was returned by Christ to its own master, or that the owner of the beast forthwith let them go, freeing them for the service of the Lord. The testimony of a prophet is joined to this event, that it may be shown that the Lord had fulfilled all things which were written of him, by the scribes and Pharisees, blinded by envy, would not understand that which they read. And so there follows, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled. For the prophet, namely Zechariah, knowing the malice of the Jews, that they were to contradict Christ as he was going up to the temple, forewarned them that they would recognize their king by this sign, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion. The title Daughter of Jerusalem was historically used to describe the city of Jerusalem, which is situated on Mount Zion. Mystically it means the church of the faithful, belonging to the heavenly Jerusalem. Behold is a phrase of one who is making something clear, that is, consider the works of his power, not in their outward, but in their spiritual meaning. For the prophet lived long before, yet he said, Behold, that he might make clear that he of whom he was speaking, even before he was born, was already your king. When therefore you shall see him, do not say, We have no king but Caesar, he cometh to thee, that he may save thee, if you will understand. If you will not, he cometh against thee, meek, that he might not be feared because of his majesty, but loved for his gentleness. He comes therefore not seated upon a golden chariot, or resplendent in purple, or mounted upon a fiery horse, eager for contention and strife, but upon a she-ass, the friend of tranquility and peace. Hence we have sitting upon an ass. The account of the evangelist is in this somewhat different from the prophetic testimony. For Matthew so uses this latter as saying that the prophet made mention of the ass. But this is not so, either according to what John has recorded or according to the ecclesiastical codices which bear the name of the Septuagint. To me the cause of this difference appears to be because Matthew is said to have written in Hebrew. But it is evident that that the translation which is called the Septuagint is in some things different from that which they who know that tongue find in the Hebrew, as also those individual scholars who have translated these same Hebrew books. And if you ask the reason for this difference, I consider that nothing is more probable than that these seventy translated by the aid of that spirit by whom that which they were translating had been uttered which is confirmed by their own wondrous harmony, for which they are praised. 
Accordingly, these translators, while in no way departing from what God intended and whose words these are, and while varying in some things, they desire nothing else than to show us the actual event, which to our delight we observe to be related with common accord and with a certain diversity by the four evangelists. By this it is made clear to us that there is no fabrication, should one of them relate something in a manner that is different, yet in no way departs from his purpose with whom he must be in agreement. To know this is profitable in regard to style, to guard against deceptions, and to faith itself, lest we should think that truth is defended by a form, as it were, of consecrated words, to the extent that God gave us not alone the truth, but also the words which are to be spoken of it, since rather the truth is held to be so far above the words that we should have no need whatever to inquire about them if we could know the revelation without them, as God knows it, and his angels know it in him. Please go to side B. And the disciples going did as Jesus commanded them. The other evangelists are silent regarding the ass, nor should the reader be concerned if Matthew were silent regarding the colt as they were regarding the ass. How much less cause have we for concern that one so spoke of the ass concerning which the rest were silent, yet as not to pass over in silence the colt concerning which the others have spoken? For where it may be gathered that both were employed, there is no discord, even though one should mention one and another the other. How much less is the danger of conflict when one mentions one and another mentions both? And they brought the ass and made him sit thereon. It would seem that the Lord could not have rode on both animals in the short space of the journey, since the simple record contains an impossibility or unseemliness let us devote ourselves to the higher, that is, to the mystical interpretation of them. Though it could have happened that the Lord rode upon each animal, it seems to me that he rode upon the ass not alone because of the divine mystery, but that he might also furnish us with a rule of holy wisdom. He shows here that it is not necessary to travel on horseback, that it suffices to use an ass, and that we should be contented with what is sufficient for our needs. But let you ask the Jews what king has ever entered Jerusalem riding upon an ass. They can tell you of none save him. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. The crowds then that had come out from Jericho and had followed the Savior laid their garments before his path and spread branches of trees in his way. And so there follows a very great multitude under the feet of the ass, lest it might stumble somewhere upon a stone, or tread upon a thorn, or slip on the uneven road. And others cut boughs from the trees, and strewed them in the way, that is, from the fruit-bearing trees with which the Mount of Olives was planted. And when they had done all this, they offered also the tribute of their voices. Hence their follows, and the multitudes cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son! What Hosanna means I shall now briefly explain. In Psalm 117, which manifestly was written concerning the coming of the Savior, among other things we also read this verse, O Lord, save me, O Lord, give good success. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In place of what is given in the Septuagint, that is, O Lord, save me, we read in the Hebrew, Anna. Adane Oceana, which Symmachus has clearly interpreted to say, I beseech thee, O Lord, save me, I beseech thee. Therefore let no one think that the saying is made up from the two phrases, the Greek and the Hebrew, rather is it holy Hebrew, and is composed from a complete phrase and an incomplete one. For Osi in Latin means salva, save, or salvica, deliver. Anna among them, the Hebrews, is the cry of one beseeching. 
For with them one who beseeches says Anna, as among Latins one in pain cries Hui. For it signifies that the coming of Christ is the salvation of the world. Hence follows, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, which our Lord also confirms in the gospel, because as in all his good works he sought not his own, but the glory of the Father. And the meaning is, blessed, that is, may he be glorified, that cometh, that is, who has become incarnate in the name of the Lord, that is, of the Father, glorifying him. Again they repeat, Hosanna, that is, save me, I beseech thee. And they determine where they wish to be as saved, in the highest, that is, in heaven, not upon the earth. Or through this, that there is added Hosanna, that is, salvation in the highest, it is clearly indicated that the coming of Christ means the salvation, not alone of men, but of the whole world, linking earthly with heavenly things. Or they praise the humanity of Christ, in that they cry out, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And his complete restoration to the house of God, in that they cry, Hosanna in the highest. Some interpret Hosanna as also meaning glory, others as meaning redemption. And both glory is due to him, and redemption belongs to him who has redeemed all men. For the words of praise clearly express the power of redemption that is in him. They call him Son of David, in whom they confess the inheritance of an eternal kingdom. Never before had the Lord made use of the services of beasts of burden, or placed upon himself as ornaments the green foliage of trees, except on this occasion, when going up to Jerusalem to fulfill his passion. For he stirred up the Jews, who beheld this and envied it, not that they might do that which previously they were not willing to do, but that they might do that which previously they desired to do. Opportunity, therefore, was given to them, not a change of purpose. But mystically the Lord draws nigh to Jerusalem, going out from Jericho, with a very great multitude following him, returning as a great man endowed with much riches, the salvation of those who believed in him. He desires to enter the city of peace and the abode of the vision of God. And he came to Bethpage, that is, to the house of Jawbones, which was a figure of praise of God, and was situated on Mount Olivet, by which is signified the light of knowledge, and rest from toil and pain. But the village that was over against the apostles, this world is signified. For it was against the apostles, and neither did it wish to submit to the yoke of true doctrine. The Lord then sends the disciples from Mount Olivet to the village, as from the primitive church he sent his preachers into the world. And he sent two, because of the two orders of preachers, which the apostle makes clear when he says, He who wrought in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision wrought in me also among the Gentiles, or because there are two precepts of charity, or because there are two testaments, or because of the letter and the spirit, or because, or because of the theoretical and the practical, that is, knowledge and good works. The ass, which was used to the yoke and subdued, and had borne the yoke of the law, is interpreted to mean the synagogue. The ass's colt, wanton and unbroken, stands for the people of the Gentiles. For Judea, in respect to God, is the mother of the Gentiles. Hence Matthew, who wrote his gospel for the Jews, alone relates that the ass was brought to the Lord, and that he might show that the salvation of this same Jewish people must not be despaired of, providing they repent. Because of certain resemblances, men are likened to these animals, not knowing God nor the Son of God. For this is an unclean animal and more unintelligent than other beasts of burthen, stupid and weak and ignoble, and toiling under a load. Such men were, before the coming of Christ, soiled by every passion, unreasoning, without sense in their speech, 
foolish in their neglect of God. For what greater folly than to despise their Creator as though He were a creature, and to adore the work of their own hands as if it were their Maker, weak of soul, ignoble because forgetful of their heavenly origin, they had become slaves of their passions and of the demons, laden because they suffered under the burden of pagan darkness and superstition, laid on them either by the demons or by the Pharisees. The ass was tied, that is, held by the chains of diabolical superstition, so that it had no freedom to go whither it willed. For before we can sin, we have freedom of will, to follow or not after the will of the devil according as we wish. But if we once have sinned, we have bound ourselves to his service and cannot free ourselves of our own power. As a ship with a broken helm is led hither and thither at the sway of the storm, so man, when he loses the aid of divine grace through sin, does not that which he wishes, but what the devil wishes. And if God does not deliver him by the strong hand of his mercy, he will remain till death in the bonds of his sins. And so he commands his disciples, Loose them, namely by means of your teaching, and through their miracles, because all Jews and Gentiles have been freed by the apostles, and bring them to me, that is, convert them to the blessedness of my kingdom. Whence it was that ascending to heaven he commanded his disciples that they should forgive sins, giving them the Holy Ghost. Those now loosed from their sins and going forward in grace, and sustained by the divinity of the word, are found worthy of being returned to the place from which he had brought them, but not now to their former tasks, but to preach there the Son of God. And this is the meaning of, and forthwith, he will let them go. Or by the ass and its colt is signified the twofold calling of the Gentiles. For the Samaritans, who serve God in accordance with certain rites of their own, are here signified by the ass. The colt signified the Gentiles, who were still wild and unbroken. And so too are sent to free those who are still in the bonds of superstition, for through Philip Samaria believed, and through Peter Cornelius was brought to Christ as the first fruits of the Gentiles. As was then said to the apostles, If any man shall say anything to you, say ye that the Lord hath need of them. So now preachers are commanded that, though enmity seek to oppose them, they should not desist from preaching the gospel. The garments of the apostles laid upon the beast may mean either the teaching of Christian virtues, the explanation of the scriptures, or the variety of the truths of the church, with which, if the soul be not adorned and clothed, it shall not merit to bear the Lord. The Lord riding on an ass went towards Jerusalem, because as the ruler who guides either the holy church or the soul of each believer, he both guides their life in this world and afterwards leads them to the site of their heavenly country. The apostles and the other teachers of the church laid their garments upon the ass, because the faith they received from Christ they gave to the Gentiles. But the multitude spread their garments in the way, because those believing from the circumcision rejected the faith given them by the law. They cut boughs from the trees, because they received from the prophets, as from green trees, proofs concerning Christ. Or the multitudes who spread their garments in the way represent the martyrs who gave their garments, that is, their bodies, which are, as it were, the clothing of their souls for Christ. Or they are signified who mortify their own bodies by self-denial. They who cut boughs from the trees are they who desire to learn the sayings and the deeds of the Holy Fathers for their own salvation and that of their children. His words, the multitudes that went before and that followed, showed that both peoples, those who believed in the Lord before the gospel and those who believed after, with one voice praise and confess the Lord. The former in prophecy acclaiming the Christ who was to come, the latter giving praise acclaim the now fulfilled coming of Christ. Origin, priest and confessor on Christ's entry into Jerusalem. 
And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, Mark in this same place writes as follows, And when they were drawing near to Jerusalem and to Bethania on the Mount of Olives, and continues, And immediately he will let him come thither. Luke relates this also in the words, When he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethania, continuing until, You shall say thus unto him, Because the Lord hath need of his service. It is worth while in such places in the gospel to apply our minds to the meaning and purpose of the writers, and to consider why, after they had related the wonders and portents of the Savior's actions, they should also record these things which reveal nothing of this sort. It is understandable that the evangelist should commemorate the restoration of sight to the blind man, the healing of the paralytic, the raising of the dead, the cleansing of the lepers, in order that those who would read their writings might be strengthened in Jesus. But what purpose had they in mind in this place, in which it is recounted, that after Jesus had with his disciples drawn near to Jerusalem, and come to Bethpage close to Mount Olivet, he sent two disciples with the command that they should loose and bring to him an ass that was tied together with its colt, he who frequently made long journeys by foot, and did not refuse to complete his sojourn here on foot, as when he had come to Jerusalem, and passing through Samaria, arrived at the well, and being weary from the road, had sat down by it. And what did Jesus also mean when he bade them loose the ass that was tied and the colt with her, telling them to answer any man who asked him, Why do you loose him? To answer that the Lord hath need of them and forthwith he will let them go. That he, the Lord, should have need of an ass and a colt, which before that were tied, reveals to us something that is worthy of his greatness. Zacharias, the prophet, the son of Barachias, increases the difficulty of the question, having uttered a prophecy concerning these things, which is worthy of our consideration, in which remarkable things were said, in these words, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout for joy, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, thy king will come to thee, the just and saviour. He is poor, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Should you wish to learn from the prophet why the daughter of Zion ought to rejoice because of the things foretold her, hear him further. And I will destroy the chariot out of Ephraim, and the horse out of Jerusalem, and the bow for war shall be broken, and he shall speak peace to the Gentiles, and his power shall be from sea to sea, and from the rivers even to the end of the earth. Thou also by the blood of thy testament hast sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit, wherein is no water. Return to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope, I will render thee double as I declare today. But lest our discourse to you run on too long, we shall leave to him who so wishes to compare this prophecy with the gospel narrative, and inquire into whatever is contained there. But we have noticed that the prophecy has not been set out by Matthew or by John in the same words. For it is not the same thing to say, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem, as to say, Tell ye the daughter of Zion. And after the words, Behold, thy king will come to thee, and before the word meek, the words which the prophet adds, the just and Saviour, have been left out by Matthew. Again, in place of riding upon an ass and a colt, the foal of her that is used to the yoke, the prophet has, riding upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass, or as some have it, a young colt. John in this place has sitting on an ass's colt instead of sitting upon an ass. But he, however, implying that here there is need of inquiry, comments, these things his disciples did not know at first. But should anyone ask how must the daughter of Zion greatly rejoice, and why should the daughter of Jerusalem shout for joy, as the prophet has proclaimed, because he was coming, riding upon an ass and a young colt, when a little later he would weep, seeing Jerusalem, that killest the prophets, and all that follows. See if you can tell whether Zion, whom he calls his daughter, and whom he bids rejoice, 
and Jerusalem also his daughter, and whom he commands to cry out for joy, are not those heavenly beings of whom it is written in the epistle of the Hebrews? But you are come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the company of many thousands of angels, or to that which is referred to in the epistle to the Galatians, but that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. And see also if these actions of the Savior are not symbolical, loosing by means of the apostles the beasts of burden from their bonds, that is, those who from this people or from the Gentiles who would confess his faith. For the ancient synagogue, the ass was bound and held fast by its sins, and bound also with it was the colt, namely the people lately newborn from among the Gentiles. And as the Savior draws near, and the way opens to the heavenly Jerusalem, he commands that both shall be freed by the teaching of his disciples, to whom he had given the Holy Spirit in these words, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. And ever since the disciples, whom he made fit ministers of the New Testament, not in the letter but in the Spirit, loosening the ass that was tied and the colt, bring them to Jesus, who wills to use as his carriage those who, by means of his true and genuine disciples, have been freed from their ancient bonds. And it truly becomes the Son of Man, since he is human, to have need of this kind of the ass that was tied and of the colt that was tied with it, for his need was that, seated upon them, he might rather refresh from toil and restore those upon whom he sat, than that they should give rest to him. But someone will ask, how the things we have said agree with what follows, and forthwith he will let them go, or as Mark tells it, and immediately he will let them come hither. The question answers itself, if you reflect upon the letting go of the two beasts according to Matthew, or of the colt according to Mark. It is manifest that there was no other lord of the beast which was bound, save our one Lord Jesus, by whom are all things, whom none would oppose from the among those who said, What do you loosing the colt? Or other like question. For that no one would oppose them, the Savior had foretold when he said, And if any man shall say anything to you, say ye that the Lord hath need of them. Or as Luke says, And if any man shall ask you, Why do you loose him? You shall say thus unto him, Because the Lord hath need of his service. You will also ask if the Savior, after he had mounted upon the beasts or upon the one, and had come to Jerusalem, had any special mission to be accomplished, which needed to be done there, as according to what is actually passed over in silence, yet indicated, though not openly, there was something which the ass and the colt were to perform. The order of the Beatitudes, as they are set down by Matthew, suggested this to me, in which after the sentence, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This was written, Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Observe here that to the first among the blessed belongs the kingdom of heaven, then those who shall possess the land, not as though they are to be on it for all time. For after they have been comforted, and because they have hungered and thirsted after justice, and been filled with it, and have received mercy, and seen God, and have been called children of God, they shall be restored again to the kingdom of heaven. And if an ass and a colt, upon which the Savior rode, chance to be put before us, take care not to be scandalized at the comparison between those who have sustained Christ and the dumb beasts of burden. Something of this kind, perhaps, the prophet had in mind when he said that he was a beast, not literally, but before God, or before his anointed, in these words, I am become as a beast before thee. For before the majesty of God, and before his word, not alone are we as beasts, but they also who are wiser and more intelligent than we are. Compared with the power of mind of our shepherd, we are his sheep. For the mind of even the wisest of men, compared with the wisdom which is in the word, 
is remoter from it than the mind of an ass or a colt, or of a sheep is from that of a man. And such are the ass and the colt which, carrying Jesus, go up to Jerusalem. But after they have come there, they are no longer a beast of burden, and its colt, by now transformed and enriched, made sharers of the divinity of the word and of his sublime doctrine, and changed by the Lord they may, for the glory of God, be returned to the place whence they were loosed, receiving this as a reward for carrying him, that they are sent back to their former place, but not to their former service. For being freed from their bonds and honored by carrying Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ would not send them back again to bondage and to baser tasks than that which they fulfilled when they had borne on their backs the Son of God. And because of this mystery, and because of the events which are recorded with it, it is but fitting that the daughter of Zion should greatly rejoice and increase the fruit of joy, which is the fruit of the Spirit, and that the daughter of Jerusalem should shout for joy. For her king has come to her, the just and Savior, not simply saving, but saving with justice and judgment, and preparing for salvation those who were to obtain it. He came to Jerusalem, and to Sion, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and upon a young colt, as we have already declared to you, visiting Israel, destroying the chariots of Ephraim, which are likened to the chariots of Pharaoh, when he overthrew the chariots of Pharaoh and all his host into the sea. Again he came, destroying the beast of war, the horse out of Jerusalem, that he might prepare peace for Israel, restoring the sheep which were lost and that he might obtain peace for Jerusalem, to bring back her children who had been driven forth. And how could this not be an event worthy of great rejoicing, that the king, the meek, the just, and savior, was thus to come to Jerusalem? When every bow of war was to be broken, so that no more should the wicked bend their bows, and have prepared their arrows in the quiver, to shoot in the dark the upright of heart. Then shall there be peace and great numbers among those that believe, and win salvation from among the Gentiles, the Savior ruling from sea to sea, and from the rivers even unto the end of the earth. Should anyone wish to interpret Zion and the daughter of Jerusalem as meaning simply the people to whom the Savior came, he can say that the word bids the daughter of Zion rejoice, and the daughter of Jerusalem to proclaim. And if some do not comply with the command of his wishes, not doing the things that are worthy of joy, not accepting the command to proclaim him, they have themselves given cause why they should suffer what they have suffered, so that it may truly be said of them, To you the gospel ought to be announced, but since you judge yourselves unworthy, behold, we turn to the Gentiles." It should be known also that the five editions of Zachary we have seen, together with the Septuagint and Aquila, have, It is meek and riding upon an ass, beast of burthen, and a young colt, or upon an ass, and an ass colt. In Theodosius, however, we find he is obedient and riding upon an ass, and a colt, the son of an ass. In Symmachus he is poor and riding upon an ass, and the colt, the son of an ass. In the fifth edition, he is poor, riding upon a yoked ass, and a colt, the son of an ass. Someone may be able to adapt these variations to the narrative by a study of this portion of the gospel, since gentle and obedient and poor the Savior was as he entered Jerusalem. For while being rich, yet was he poor, so that those who listen to him, who hears us, may, through his poverty, become rich. We note that Matthew speaks of Bethpage, Mark of Bethania, and Luke of Bethpage and Bethania. These events took place upon a mount which is called Olivet. Bethpage, which means the house of jawbones, was a villa belonging to the priests. Bethania means house of obedience. They are brought to the house of obedience who were loosed from their bonds, that there Jesus might sit upon them, and to the house of Jawbones, which name is taken from the book of Judges, 
in which the spring of the jawbone is mentioned, in which Samson quenched his thirst, or perhaps it represents the mystery of patience, in which our Lord enjoins on us that if a man strike thee on thy right cheek, you should then turn to him the other. Bethpage, then, is, we may say, a symbol of their patients who attained to salvation. Hence, Jesus seated himself upon those whom the disciples, at his command, had delivered from bonds. The Mount is the Mount of Olives, the church, where those within it, because they are fertile and fruit-bearing, declare, But I, as a fruitful olive tree in the house of God, have hoped in the mercy of God. And they who have been taught the beginnings of the faith are as olive plants around about thy table as his sons and children. If we turn to the consideration of the two disciples whom Jesus sent to bring the ass that was tied and the colt with her, so that untied they might bring them to him, may we not say that these stand for the two disciples Peter and Paul, who gave to each other the right hand of fellowship, that Peter should go on to the circumcision, to those bound to the yoke of the law, and Paul to the colt that was unbroken, the Gentiles. Before Jesus came, both the ass and the colt were in the village where they were tied, not in the city. And the disciples loosed both and brought them to Jesus. Again, if you regard the two disciples allegorically, you will then say that one of them is of the order of those who minister to the circumcision, the other to the Gentiles, and between them, those bidden by Jesus to loose what were to be loosed, is a fellowship of work and mind. So to anyone, saying to them as they loosed, Why loose the colt, or anything, they reply, We declare to you that the Lord has need of those who till now were in bonds. He has need of them that he may be seated upon them who are loosed from their sins and have obtained forgiveness. For upon those who are still tied and fast bound with the ropes of their sins, upon these Jesus does not sit. Now, now according to Mark and Luke we read, You shall find a colt tied upon which no man yet hath sat. For nothing based on reason or conformable to man's nature had penetrated and taken firm hold of the cult of the Gentiles. And happy was he upon whom till now nothing based on reason had been established, that God should come to rest upon him, the Word, the Son of God, so that guided by his hand upon the reins he might reach to the Jerusalem of God. Let us dwell upon these things here put before us. And let he who is endowed with more understanding and who receives more grace, bring to light more and better considerations upon it, and such as are more adapted to the ears of those who thirst for the clear truth of the gospel. And the disciples going did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the ass and the colt, and laid their garments upon them. Mark, however, relates the event in these words, And going their way they found the colt, tied before the gate without in the meeting of the two ways, and they loose them. And then he continues on till the words, Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh, peace in the highest. Luke, however, has, And they that were sent went their way, and found the colt standing, as he had said unto them, and the rest which follows until the words, If these shall hold their peace, the stones will cry out. After what we have already said regarding the two disciples who were sent to loose the ass and the colt that was with it, and after what we have added on this passage, we shall here expound that which is now before us, where it is related that his two disciples, going and doing as the Savior had told them, bring to him the ass and the colt. And these they did not leave uncovered, but clothed and adorned them with the garments which were their own covering so that the word of God alone might be placed and take his rest upon the ass and the colt, now adorned with the clothing of those who taught them truth, guiding as with a rein the animals which were now freed of their bonds 
and bearing him. And Jesus sat upon the garments of those who by their preaching instructed both the ass and the colt, the circumcision and the Gentiles. And since it was fitting that every one should offer something to the meek king, who came riding upon an ass and upon a colt, mm -hmm. a very great multitude entered with Jesus into Jerusalem, who also manifested the fruit of their acceptance of the Savior, when they spread their garments and every adornment they possessed before the ass and the colt on which he sat. Along the way the ass and the colt followed to Jerusalem, the great multitude placed their garments so that the ass and the colt might go up to Jerusalem through places that were free of earth and earthly things and unstained by its dust. And besides the two disciples, the great multitude who spread their garments in the way, a third group is mentioned. Others adorned the way along which Jesus ascended to Jerusalem, mounted upon these animals. This adorning was made with branches cut from trees and spread on the ground on either side of the garments. Unless this is in fact a fourth group, for one was the group of disciples who freed the animals, another was the ass and the colt, a third was a very great crowd, and the fourth then was composed of those who cut boughs from the trees and strewed them in the way. Besides these you may see here a fifth and sixth group, from those that went before Jesus and those that followed after. But they who went before him, you may say, are drawn from the saints and prophets who lived before his coming. They who follow, from the apostles and from the just who joined him after the coming of the word. And they who went before him, and they who followed, proclaim the same thing. For all together, in one united voice, they cry, proclaiming the humanity of the Savior, Hosanna to the Son of David, and his second coming in this canticle, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, and his complete restoration to the house of God in the greeting, Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Please go to the next tape. Bishop and Doctor On the Colt, a figure of the Gentiles. Strikingly does the Lord go up to the temple, for having turned from the Jews, he will now abide in the hearts of the Gentiles. For that temple is the true one in which the Lord is adored, not in the letter, but in the spirit. That is the temple of God which is based on the truths of the Christian faith, not on the structure of stone. Accordingly, they who hate him are passed by, and they who will love him are preferred before them. And for this he comes to the Mount of Olives, that by his heavenly strength he may plant the young olives, whose mother is that Jerusalem which is above Upon this mountain he is the heavenly husbandman, so that all who are planted in the house of God may one by one declare, But I, as a fruitful olive tree in the house of God, have hoped in the mercy of God forever. And perhaps Christ is himself the mountain. Who other than he could bring forth such fruitful olive trees, not such as bend under the weight of their fruit, but those which by the fullness of the Spirit abound with Gentiles, he it is by whom we go up and to whom we ascend. He is the door, he is the way, who is opened and who opens, on which they must knock who are to enter, and who is adored by those that are found worthy. And he was in a village, and a colt was tied there, and an ass. It could not be loosed, save by the command of the Lord. An apostolic hand loosed it. Such was the means such the life, such the grace. Be you of such a kind, that you also may loose those that are bound. Now let us ponder who they were, who discovered in sin, were cast out of paradise, and banished to a village, and see how life recalls those whom death had driven forth. And so we read, according to Matthew, an ass and a colt, so that as in the person of two human beings, each sex was driven out, in the two animals either sex is recalled. Consequently, in the mother ass we have a figure of Eve who erred. 
in the colt a figure of the people of the Gentiles. And he is seated on the colt of the ass, and rightly, on which no man ever hath sitten. Because no man before Christ had called the people of the Gentiles into the church. And Mark too has the same, upon which no man yet hath sat. It was, however, held fast, tied by the bonds of unbelief, in bondage to an evil master, enslaved by falsehood. But he had no just claim to dominion whom guilt, not nature, had made master. And because of this, when Lord is said, one only is held true Lord, for there are many gods and many lords, but for us there is but one Lord and one God. And though he is not named as Lord, yet is it indicated, not by conjunction of a person, but through community of nature. Mark introduces the beast as bound before the gate without, for whosoever is outside of Christ is without in the way, but he that is in Christ is not outside in the way. In the meeting of two ways, he adds, where he is the certain possession of no one, and there is no stall, no roof, no manger. Unhappy the servitude with none but uncertain rights, for he that has no master will have many. Strangers will tie him fast to make him theirs. Another frees him that he may keep him for himself so he makes acquaintance with harsher gifts than fetters. And so it was not without design that two disciples are sent, Peter to Cornelius, Paul to the rest. And so the persons sent are not named, only the number of them is made known. Should you ask if anyone were sent by name, let him think of Philip, whom the Spirit sent to Gaza on the occasion of his baptizing the eunuch of Queen Candence and who sowed the word of God from Azoto through all the cities into Caesarea. Nor should we fail to note that he declared that they would then return, for they had to be formed in soul who would preach the Lord Jesus to every nation. And they who accordingly were sent, did they, while freeing the colt, speak in their own name? Far from it. They said only what the Lord had told them that you may learn that the faith is spread among the nations of the Gentiles, not through your eloquence, but by the word of God, not by your name, but in the name of Christ, and that before this divine authority the powers of evil, who have usurped dominion over the nations, give way and withdraw. For which reason also was it that the apostles spread their garments before the path of Christ, and doing this anticipated the honor shown to the preaching of the gospel. For in the divine scriptures garments frequently symbolize deeds showing power or moral excellence, which would by their own particular virtue so often soften pagan hardness that they would, through friendly dispositions, win them the assistance of a safe and favored road. It was not for pleasure the Lord of the world was born a public spectacle upon the back of an ass, but that he might, by the mystery within him, caparison the inner chambers of our soul, and as a mystic rider occupy an interior seat in the depths of our hearts, penetrating there, as it were, by a certain substance of his divinity, guiding the steps of the soul, restraining the wantonness of the flesh, so that made gentle by the hand of kindness he might then wholly rule in the hearts of the Gentiles. Happy they who have welcomed this writer in their inmost heart. Happy they whose mouth the reins of the heavenly word hold fast, so that it may not be loosened by a multitude of words. What is this rein, brethren? Who shall teach me in what manner it restrains, or opens the mouths of men? He has told me of this rain, who said, And for me that speech may be given to me, that I may open my mouth with confidence. Speech, therefore, is the rain, speech the goad, and on that account it is hard for thee to kick against the goad. Thus he has here taught us to open our heart, to endure the goad, to bear the yoke. May he also teach us to put up with the restraint of others' loquacity, for rarer is the power of silence than that of speech. 
May he wholly instruct us, who was as one dumb, who opened not his mouth against betrayal, who stood ready for the scourges, and refused not the stripes, so that God may find prepared in us a fitting resting place. Amen. St. Jerome, Priest and Doctor, on the Meaning of the Gospel And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, he goes out from Jericho, drawing with him from there a great multitude, and having given back sight to the blind, he draws near to Jerusalem. He comes back, great, enriched with mighty rewards, the salvation of those who have believed in him, and eager to enter the tower of the watchman, the place of the vision of God, the city of peace. And when they had drawn near to Jerusalem and come to Beth's Beth page, to the house of the jawbones, a villa belonging to the priests, and a figure of praise to God situated on Mount Olivet, in which we have a figure of the lamp of knowledge and of rest from weariness and toil, he sent two of his disciples, that is, knowledge and work, that they might go into the village. He said to them, Go ye into the village that is over against you, for it was against the apostles, and unwilling to accept the yoke of their teaching. And immediately, he says, you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. For the ass was tied with the manifold bonds of sin. The colt, wanton and unbroken, was with its mother, and according to Luke was subject not to one error or to one doctrine, but to many masters. And yet the many masters who had claimed unlawful ownership of him, when they see the true master, and his servants, whom he had sent to free them, has come, they do not dare to oppose him. Who this ass is, and who the colt, we shall set out in what follows. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled. This prophecy is found written in the prophet Zachary, of which we shall speak, in its proper place, of our days of life permit. Now we shall say briefly, that literally he could not ride on both animals in that short stretch of way. He either rode on the ass, and the colt was riderless, or if he sat upon the colt, which is more founded, the ass was led free. And therefore, since the actual record of the fact savors of the impossible or the unseemly, let us apply ourselves to a higher interpretation, namely that by this ass we are to understand the synagogue, which was tamed and broken to the yoke, and had borne the yoke of the law. The colt of the ass, wanton and unbroken, is the people of the Gentiles, upon whom Christ sat, and that he had sent his two disciples to them, the one to the circumcision and the other to the Gentiles. And the disciples going did as Jesus commanded. This colt and the ass, upon which the apostles laid their garments, that Jesus might ride softly, were naked before the coming of the Savior, and without covering, suffered from cold, and many sought to establish possession of them. But after they had received the clothing of the apostle, and were made more seemly, they have the Lord as their rider. The ap apostolic clothing can be understood to mean either the teaching of virtue, or the explanation of the scriptures, or the variety of the church's teachings with which, if a soul be not clothed and adorned, it cannot merit to have Jesus seated in it. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Observe the differences between the persons represented. The apostles lay their garments upon the ass. The crowd, as lesser in degree, spread theirs before the feet of the ass, lest it should anywhere stumble on a stone, or tread on a thorn, or its foot slip in a hole and others cut boughs and strewed them in the way. They cut branches from the fruit-bearing trees with which the Mount of Olives was planted, and spread them in the way, so as to make the crooked ways straight and the rough ways smooth, that Christ, the conqueror of sin, might walk straightly and safely into the hearts of the faithful. And the multitudes that went before and that followed. Since the literal order of events is manifest, let us treat of the mystical order. The crowds which had come out from Jericho and had followed the Savior and his disciples 
when they saw the ass's colt, which before was tied, now free and adorned with the clothing of the apostles, and saw the Lord Jesus sitting upon it, spread their garments under him, and strewed branches of trees in his path. And when they had done all that was to be done by their hands, they offered also the tribute of their voices. And going before and following after, they cry, not in a brief and wordless confession, but with all their might, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In saying the multitudes that went before and that followed, he shows that the peoples who preceded the gospel and they who after the preaching of the gospel believed in the Lord with one harmonious voice give praise to Jesus. And after the example of the parable recorded earlier of the workers who were called at different hours, they also receive the common reward of faith. And as to the meaning of what follows, Hosanna to the Son of David, you may remember that many years ago I spoke of this in a short letter to Damasus, then bishop of the city of Rome, and shall now again briefly touch on it. In the hundredth and seventeenth psalm, which manifestly was written concerning the coming of the Savior, among other things we also find this, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us be glad and rejoice therein. And immediately there follows, O Lord, save me. O Lord, give me good success. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Where we read in the Septuagint, O Lord, save us. In the Hebrew we read, Anna Adonai Oceana, which Symmachus has clearly rendered as saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, save us, do I beseech thee. Let no one therefore think these words are made up from two phrases, a Greek and a Hebrew, that it is a composite utterance, for it is holy Hebrew, and signifies that the coming of Christ is the salvation of the world. Hence there follows, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The Savior also confirms this himself in his gospel, saying, I am come in the name of my Father, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. And through what follows, Hosanna in the highest, it is distinctly indicated that the coming of Christ is for the salvation, not alone of men, but of the whole world joining the things of earth to those that are above, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those that are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Amen. St. John Chrysostom, Bishop and Doctor, on the lessons of today's Gospel. The Lord had often entered Jerusalem, but never before with such solemnity. What then was the reason for this? The other occasions were at the beginning of his divine mission. Neither was he yet well known, nor had his time to suffer yet come. For this reason he would then mingle freely with the people, seeking rather to remain unknown. And had he shown himself in this manner then, he would have excited no great interest and his enemies would have been aroused to greater anger. But when he had given sufficient proof of his power, and the cross was at the very doors, he revealed himself more clearly, and did publicly whatever might stir up the $1, things that were to come. Best Buy gift card winner. This could have happened at the beginning, but done in that way it would not have been of advantage, nor expedient. But see with me how many miracles there have been, how many prophecies fulfilled. He said, you shall find an ass. He foretells that no one will oppose them, and that those who would hear them would say nothing. This was no light condemnation of the Jews, that he persuades men who knew him not at all, and whom he had not seen, to give up without a word what was theirs, and this through his disciples. Yet this people refused to obey him when he performed signs and wonders in their presence. Do not look upon what happened on this occasion as being of slight importance, 
For who was it persuaded them not to oppose the disciples when their property was taken from them? Poor men that they were, and tillers of the soil. What am I saying, not to oppose them, not even to answer, or at least having answered them to fall silent and yield? For both facts are alike wonderful, that they said nothing when their beasts were taken away, and that when they heard that the Lord had need of them, they yielded and did not oppose them, especially since they did not see the Lord himself, but only his disciples. From this he teaches us that he could have restrained the Jews, even against their will, when they were getting ready to lay hands on him, and could have stricken them dumb, but he willed not to. From this he likewise teaches his disciples that whatsoever he might ask of them they should give. Even should he bid them give up life itself, even that must not be denied. For if these obeyed him who knew him not, much more should they be prepared to give up all things for him. Added to this, he was fulfilling a twofold prophecy, the one in the word, the other in deed. And that which he fulfilled in deed, he fulfilled sitting upon an ass, and that in word was the prophecy of Zacharias. For he had said, The king will come riding upon an ass. And riding thus, he gave a beginning to another prophecy, which prefigured the things to come by what he was now doing. How and in what way? He foretold the calling of the unclean Gentiles, namely, that he would take his rest upon them, that they would come to him and would follow him. And so prophecy gives way to prophecy. But it does not seem to me that it was for this alone he rode upon the ass, but that he might also give us examples of holy wisdom. For not alone does he fulfill the prophecies, not alone did he plant the word of truth, but also in these happenings he gave us guidance regarding our lives, providing us with a rule of conduct for every need, teaching us by every means how to live worthily. And so when he was about to be born he did not seek out a splendid home, nor look for a rich and illustrious mother, but for a poor woman, one whose husband was a carpenter. And he was born in a stable and placed in a manger. And when he chose his apostles, he did not choose scholars and wise men, nor rich men and high-born, but poor men of poor families and everywhere unknown. And for his food, now he provides loaves made from barley, now he sends his disciples to buy something in the market. His bed was of reeds, his clothing what was plain and in common use. House he had none. When he had need to go from place to place, he went on foot, and so journeying grew weary. And when he sat down, he had no need of throne or cushion, but sat upon the ground, sometimes on a mount, sometimes by a well. And not only by a well, but alone, as when he spoke to the Samaritan woman. Again giving us a right measure in grief, when he must mourn, he weeps a little, everywhere giving us, as I say, measures and standards showing us how far we should go, and where we should stop. And so now, since it happens that some being weak will have need of a beast of burden, here too he lays down a measure, showing us there is no need of horse or mule, but that we should use an ass, and that everywhere we should confine ourselves to what we need. Let us consider this prophecy, one of words and one of deeds. But then, is this prophecy? It is this. Behold, thy king will come to thee, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of her that is used to the yoke, not drawn in a chariot like other kings, not demanding a tribute, not surrounded by officers and guards, and in this also showing meekness. Then ask the Jews, What king has ever entered Jerusalem riding upon an ass? There is none that they can say, Save this one. And this, I say, he did, signifying the things that are to come. For by the colt the church is signified, and also the new people, who before were unclean, but became clean as soon as Jesus had rested on them. And note with me how everywhere the allegory is continued, for it is the disciples that loose the beasts, and it is through the apostles that both we and they have been called to the faith, and through the apostles have we brought 
been brought to Jesus. And because the glory of our calling has made these others envious, so the ass is seen to follow the colt. For after Christ has been seated upon the Gentiles, moved by jealousy, they also will come. Of this Paul has warned us, saying, that blindness in part has happened in Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles should come in, and so all Israel should be saved. That this is a prophecy is plain from what has already been said, otherwise the prophet would not have troubled to tell us the condition of the ass. But not alone are these things foretold, but also that the apostles would bring them without difficulty. For as no man here opposes them, preventing them, so that in the apostles' bringing in of the Gentiles, not one of those who before had claimed dominion over them could withstand them. Neither did the Lord sit upon the unclothed colt, but upon one covered by the garments of the apostles. For they, after they find the colt, give up all things. As Paul has written, But I most gladly will spend and be spent myself for your souls. And observe also the obedience of the colt, which, though untamed and unbroken to the rein, was now well behaved. This also was a prophecy of what was to come, foretelling the submissiveness of the Gentiles and their ready turning to right order. For the words, Loose them and bring them to me, disposed all things towards due order, so that what was disordered might be brought to order and what was unclean might thenceforward become clean. But observe the baseness of the Jews. So many wonders had he wrought, yet they remained indifferent. But seeing a multitude gathered, then they marveled. And when he was come into Jerusalem, the whole city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the people said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And when they thought themselves to be saying something great, even then their mind was commonplace and base and earthy. He was doing these things not for display, but, as I say, to fulfill the prophecy, and at the same time to teach us holy wisdom, and also to comfort his disciples, now grieving because of his death, showing them that it was of his own free will that he was to suffer. And note the accuracy of the prophet, how he has foretold everything, David foretold some things, and Zachary others. So let us also do these things. Let us cry out in hymns, and let us give our garments to those who bear him. For of what shall we be worthy if, when others have covered with their garments the ass upon which he sat, and others have spread their clothing before his feet, we see him naked who are not called upon to shed our garments, but to give a little, and yet do not show even this sign of zeal? They walk before him, and follow after him, but should he draw near to us, we repel him. How grievous the chastisement, the punishment, such conduct merits! The Lord in his need turns to you. You do not even wish to hear his petition. You reproach him, you rebuke him, and this too after you have been hearing such words as these. And if in the giving of a loaf or a little money you are so mean and so harsh, what would you be like if you had to give up everything? You have seen the spendthrifts in the theater, how much they squander on harlots. You do not bestow in alms even the half of this, nor the least part of it. Should the devil bid you to give to any chance comer, and even though you are fostering hell's fire, you give. But let Christ command you to give to someone in need, promising you a kingdom. Not alone do you not give, you insult, you prefer to obey the devil, that he may punish you, than to obey Christ and earn salvation. What folly could be greater? The one offers you hell, the other heaven. Yet you leave the one and run to the other, and you repulse him as he comes to you, he to whom from afar you pray. And this is just as if a king clad in the royal purple and offering you a diadem, could not gain your good will, while a thief brandishing a sword at you and threatening you with death can do so easily. Reflecting on these things, beloved, let us even now open our eyes and be watchful. 
I am ashamed to speak of alms since I have spoken so often on this theme, but without any great fruit for my exhortations. You have given more, but not as much as I have need of. I see that you sow, but not with a generous hand. And because of this I fear you shall reap but sparingly. To prove that you sow, but sparingly, let us, if you will, estimate who are the more numerous in the city, the rich or the poor, and who are neither rich or poor, but hold a place in between. A tenth part of the city is rich. A tenth are the poor who possess nothing. The rest hold the middle place. Let us then divide the whole city among the poor, and you will see what a shameful state of things exists. For the rich are few, they who come next are many. The poor are far fewer than these. And though there are many who feed the poor, yet many go hungry to sleep. And this not because the rich have not the wherewithal to feed them, but because they are hard and unfeeling. For where the rich and those next to them, to apportion amongst them those who are in need of food and clothing, you would scarcely find one poor person to be helped for fifty or even a hundred of the rest. And though there are many who can help, yet day by day the poor go wanting. And that you may learn the inhumanity of these others, while the church has the income of but one of the rich, and even of one of the medium rich, think of how many widows, how many virgins, she daily provides for. The number has reached three thousand. Add to those the needy she succors each day, those held in prison, the sick in the hospitals, the others who are getting on well, the pilgrims, the maimed, those who serve the altar, and those who come daily needing food and clothing. And yet her substance in no way grows less. And so were there only ten rich men prepared to give to the full, there would be no poor. What then, you will say, would remain for our children? The principle would remain, and the income would be increased, for you would then have laid up treasure in heaven. And should you not wish to do this, then give a half, a third, or a fourth, or a fifth, or a tenth. For by God's favor it is possible for this our city to feed the poor of ten cities. And if you wish, let us reckon this up. Nay, there is no need to reckon, for it is obvious how easily this could be done. See how often and how much one family does not hesitate to spend on a public occasion and scarcely notices the cost. If one of the rich were to do this in the service of the poor, in one brief moment he would seize heaven. What excuse have you, therefore, what shadow of excuse, when from that which departing from here we must leave behind, we do not give as generously to the poor as others bestow in public display? and this when we could gain so much by doing so. And even were we to be in this world forever, we ought not to be sparing in this so worthy giving. But when in a little while we must go, born naked hence, what plea have we to offer, we who from what flows into us give nothing to the poor and the hungry? I'm not urging you to give up your capital, not that I am reluctant, but because I see that you are exceedingly so. And so I do not ask you, but spend of your returns. Gather no wealth from them. Let it suffice for you that you have a return from your money, flowing to you as from a fountain. Make the poor sharers of this, and be a good steward of the things which God has given thee. But you will say, I pay my taxes. Is it because of this, then, you are scornful? that no one demands your help? You do not dare to oppose the one who compels you and torments you, and that whether the earth bears a crop or not, but to the one that is meek and asks of you only when the earth is fruitful, you do not answer even with a word. And who will deliver you from this intolerable punishment? There is no one who can. For if in the first case you pay up quickly because of the punishments for non-payment, then reflect that here even severer punishments await you, not merely to be bound, not simply to be thrown into prison, but to depart into eternal fire. Let us then, because of this, pay these taxes first, 
for great is the facility for payment, and greater still the reward. And the greater our means, the greater the punishment should we act unworthily. For a punishment shall come upon you that will have no end. But if you offer me as an excuse the needs of the men who are fighting for you against the barbarian, there is here also an army of the poor who wage war and fight on your behalf. For when they receive from you, by their prayers they win the favor of God for you. And in placating him, they repulse the assaults, not of the barbarians, but of the devils. They overcome the violence of the evil one, and do not permit him to attack unceasingly, and they weaken his strength. When therefore you see those soldiers fighting daily on your behalf with the devil by their prayers, demand from yourself a good contribution, their food. For their king, being mild, he has laid it on no one to demand it from you, desiring that you give it freely. And even though you pay little by little, he accepts it. And if being in difficulties you do not pay it for a long time, he will not press him that has not. Let us not then abuse his patience. Let us treasure up for ourselves not wrath but salvation, not death but life, not penalties and punishment, but honor and crown. There is no need here to pay the cost of the transport of your offerings, no need here to labor to turn them into money. But if you but lay them down, the Lord will raise them to heaven. He will himself make the transaction profitable for you. There is no need here to find someone to carry what you have offered. Offer it, and straight away your offering ascends to heaven, not that by its soldiers it may be fed, but that it may be laid up for you with greater profit. Here below, whatever you pay you cannot recover. There you shall receive it again with great honor, and receive greater in spiritual profits. Here what is given is demanded, there it is alone capital, a debt. For God has given you a bond. He that hath mercy of the poor lendeth to the Lord. He gave you also a pledge and a security, though he is God. What kind of a pledge? The things of the present life, visible things, spiritual things, the beginnings of that which is to come. Why then do you hesitate? Why are you reluctant? when you have received so many and such things, and look forward to so many. For what you have received are these. He gave you a body, and he placed a soul in it. You alone on the earth has he honored with reason. He has given you the use of whatever is visible, and bestowed on you the knowledge of himself. He gave up his son for you. He has given you a baptism that bears with it many gifts and a holy table, and promised you a kingdom, the things which cannot be described. So much have you received, and so much are you yet to receive, and yet you are sparing of money that will perish. And what excuse will you have? You look at your children, and you make excuses because of them. Teach these also to seek the same kind of gain. For if you have your capital placed at interest, and your debtor is an upright man, you would certainly prefer to leave a bond to your child instead of gold, so that he would thus have a safe return and not be forced to seek others with whom to place it. Give such a deed to your children now, and leave them God as their debtor. You do not sell your fields, but leave them to your children, that they may have an income, and so that the increase of the property comes to them. Do not fear to leave them this deed, so much more fruitful than any field or any yield whatever. What great folly, what madness would this be? And this, when you know that leaving it to them, you yet bring it with you when you go from here. For such things being spiritual have in them a great fruitfulness. Let us then not be poor in spirit, nor without mercy towards ourselves, but let us invest in this worthy enterprise, so that we may both bring it with us when we depart this life, and still leave it to our children. And so doing we shall attain to the things that are to come by the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom with the Father and the Holy Ghost let there be honor, glory, and majesty 
now and forever, world without end. Amen. St. Leo the Great, Pope and Doctor, on the Passion of Our Lord. The festival of the Passion, dearly beloved, so earnestly looked forward to, so desired of all men, is now here. And it does not suffer us to remain silent in face of the exaltation rising from our joy of soul. For though it is not easy, time after time, to speak in a fitting and worthy manner upon this same solemnity, yet it is not lawful for the priest to withhold from the ears of the faithful the ministry of his word upon this so great mystery of the divine compassion, since this subject, in that it is unutterable, gives matter without end for speaking. Nor may what we say fall short, for of what we speak never can there be enough. Let human weakness bow down before the glory of God. May it ever find itself unequal to the task of unfolding the works of the divine mercy. Let us labor in our understanding. Let us remain poor in talent and wanting in the power of words. It is good for us to learn how little we truly know of the majesty of God. For the prophet tells us, Seek ye the Lord and be strengthened. Seek his face forevermore. So no one may presume that he has found all that he is seeking, lest he cease to be close to him who has ceased to draw near him. And among all the works of God, before which the mind grows faint with awe, which so rejoices yet overwhelms the soul as the passion of our Savior. For as often as we dwell, as best we can, upon his omnipotence, which he shares with the Father in one and the same nature, more wondrous does his lowliness seem to us than his power, and with more difficulty do we grasp his emptying himself of the divine majesty than his sublime uplifting of the form of a servant. Yet it helps us greatly to understand that while one is the creator, one the created, one the inviolable divinity, one the suffering flesh, what belongs to either nature meets in the single person, so that whether in might or in suffering, his the humiliation, whose also the glory. By this rule of faith, which we learn from the beginning of the creed, on the authority of apostolic teaching, we confess that the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we declare to be the only Son of God, the Father Almighty, was also born of the Holy Ghost from the Virgin Mary, nor do we deny his majesty when we believe that he was crucified and died and that on the third day he rose again. For his divinity together with his humanity has fulfilled all that was required of God and of man. Yet so that while the impassable was present in the passable, power was not diminished by infirmity, nor infirmity swallowed up by power. With reason was the blessed Apostle Peter praised for his confession of this unity. He who, when the Lord asked whom did the disciples say he was, quickly forestalling the words of all the rest, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this he saw, not through any one of flesh and blood telling him, for their telling it could have but hindered his inward seeing, but through the Spirit of the Father, working in his own believing heart, so that, while he was being prepared for the ruling of the universal church, he might first learn what he was to teach, and might hear, as a reward for this firmness in the faith he was to teach, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. For this the strong Christian faith, which, built upon an indestructible rock, fears not the gates of death, confesses one Lord Jesus Christ, who is both true God and true man, believing that the same is the virgin son who is the author of the mother, that the same was born at the end of ages who is the author of all times, that the same is both Lord of all majesty and one of the race of mortal men, and that he who is without sin in the likeness of sinful flesh was offered up in behalf of sinners that he might deliver man from the bonds of the death-bringing transgression, 
he concealed the power of his majesty from the fury of the devil, and offered him instead the infirmity of our lowliness. For had this proud and cruel enemy known the plan of God's mercy, he would have striven rather to temper with mildness the hearts of the Jews than to inflame them with evil hate, so that he might not lose the slavery of all his captives, while he pursued the liberty of the one who owed him nothing. And so he was tricked by his own wickedness. He inflicted a torment on the Son of God, which was changed into a medicine for all the sons of men. He shed innocent blood, which then became both the price and the drink which restored the world. The Lord took upon himself what he had freely chosen. He suffered upon himself the impious hands of those who raged against him, who while intent on their dreadful crime yet served the plan of the Redeemer. And such was the tenderness of his love even for those who put him to death, that from the cross he begged his father not that he be revenged, but that they might be forgiven, crying out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it was certainly through the power of this intercession that the hearts of many of those who had cried, His blood be upon us and upon our children, were changed to repentance at the preaching of the Apostle Peter, so that in one day there were baptized about three thousand of the Jews, and they became all of one heart and one soul, ready to give their lives for him for whose crucifixion they had clamored. The traitor Judas did not attain to this mercy, for the son of perdition, at whose right hand the devil had stood, had before this died in despair, even while Christ was fulfilling the mystery of the general redemption. Even he perhaps might have obtained this forgiveness, had he not hastened to the gallows tree, for the Lord died for all evil doers. But nothing ever of the warnings of the Savior's mercy found place in that wicked heart, at one time given over to petty cheating, and then committed to this dread parasitical traffic. On these impious ears in vain had fallen the words of the Lord, declaring, I am not come to call the just, but sinners, or the words, I came not to call the just, but sinners to penance. Neither had he given thought to the clemency of Christ, who ministered not alone to the infirmities of the body, but healed likewise the wounds of the injured soul, as in his words to the paralytic, Be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And to the woman brought before him who was an adulteress, Neither will I condemn thee. Go, and now sin no more so that he might show throughout all his works that in his coming he had appeared not as the judge of the world, but as its savior. But the godless betrayer, shutting his mind to all these things, turned upon himself, not with a mind to repent, but in the madness of self-destruction, so that this man who had sold the author of life to the executioners of his death, even in the act of dying, sinned unto the increase of his own eternal punishment. Please go to side B. This, therefore, which false witnesses, which blood-stained rulers, which impious priests have done to the Lord Jesus Christ by means of a coward judge and the aid of the imperial soldiery, must be both lovingly embraced and repudiated with horror for all ages to come. For the cross of the Lord, an instrument of torture in the intention of the Jews, is become glorious in the might of the crucified. The multitude raged against one man. Christ had compassion on all men. What was inflicted through cruelty was suffered by majesty so that in the permitting of the evil deed the purpose of the eternal will might be accomplished. For this reason the whole order of events, as narrated so fully in the gospel, must be so accepted by the faithful, that while believing in what was done when the passion of Christ was being fulfilled, we may come to understand that in Christ not alone were our sins remitted, but there was set here before us the perfect model of love, 
but that we may, with God's help, expound this more at length, we shall keep this part of our sermon till the fourth hour of the Sabbath. By the grace of God and the aid of your good prayers, we hope to fulfill this promise. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost will reign forever. Amen.